me ask for the fourth time, are there any questions from the material of the last class? That, that, means, that means either you weren't paying attention, or, 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 or that I, I was just so brilliant I left nothing in doubt. That, that's why I'm going to consider that possibility as well. Um, yes. Yes, sir. When did Samaria become separate from Israel? <laughs> Last class. <laughs> okay. okay. When the Ten Laws tribe got lost. The, uh, we ended our last class with the division of Israel's kingdom into north and south. When Samaria became something different from Israel, uh, became something different from Judah. Okay. Samaria is the capital of the north. I'll be referring to that map. And I, I thank Nancy for downloading that map. I don't have the technical skills to do something like that. Uh, now let's recall the scene. In the year 922, the delegation from the northern tribes requested certain political reforms from Solomon's son, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, David's grandson. As we saw, Rehoboam scorned their petition, and a schism ensued. And I accused, in my last class, I accused Rehoboam of acting like an adolescent. Okay. Eva pointed out that he was 41 years old at the time. I renew my objection. <laughs> I bet plenty of people who didn't have their act together by age 41. Uh, what do you mean I met them? I was one of them myself, can I think about it? Unlike, now that I'm on the, I'm on the step of 85, I almost beginning to get my act together, almost. Now, this schism, the separation of the north, called Kol Israel, all of Israel, from the tribe of Judah in the south, had two large political causes. And we'll begin this morning by considering those. First, Solomon's disrespect for the tribal histories of the people. Solomon wanted to create a whole new political, cultural, and social experience. He took advantage of the conquest that had been made by Saul and David. Solomon, Solomon, wanted a, Solomon wanted a renaissance, a rebirth of the people. It was cultural, it was, it was literary, but all of these things depend on finance. He's gonna to have to reform the finances, and he really does. He creates an enormous amount of wealth, wealth by taking advantage of, of Israel's connection with the Euphrates River and with Egypt and with, and with the Gulf of Aqaba and also the trade relations with Phoenicia. But in doing that, he disrespected the history of the people. By the end of Solomon's reign, the nation was no longer a confederation of tribes. It started as a confederation of tribes. By the time Solomon died, it was no longer a confederation of tribes. Have you seen the the TV series, Ken Burns, I think, put out 
on the Civil War. Be sure to see that. Be sure to see that. It's probably the last, the last, aside from gods and generals, it's probably the last time there was a sane look at the Civil War. Uh, I haven't known what they teach them about the Civil War now. Can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. Ken Burns' uh, movie, series, The Civil War. And also the movie, Gods and Generals. If the Civil War even faintly resembled what the way I hear it be presented now, it's not, it's incomprehensible why anybody would do this. But obviously a group of Americans believed that the nation was composed of a union of states and it never occurred to them that you couldn't leave when you wanted to. Their loyalties were to their states. It just did not occur to them that you couldn't leave when you wanted to. So they left. And then are very surprised when the other people, hey, you're not allowed to do that. And that's what happened. Now, why they left, the reason they left, and so forth, that's a, that's a different question. Which is, which is why, after the war was over, the winning side realizing this, did not punish those who led the rebellion. They didn't punish them. They realized, you know, you're going to create a much worse situation. However, from that point on, nobody thinks of his loyalty, that his loyalty is, is to Virginia. His loyalty is to the United States. Robert E. Lee believed that his loyalty was to Virginia. The United States was second. That, that was, a, that was, that was a, a sincerely held belief that cost Robert E. Lee everything to make that decision. Uh, so, and even, even those who thought Robert E. Lee should be hanged, like, like uh, Henry Adams, for example, in his, uh, which, which book is it? It's his book on uh, Mont Saint Michel and, uh, and, and Chart. He, he says, I think it's in that book, he says that. Robert E. Lee should have been hanged, even though he was a good man and sincere. <laughs> well, hello. Uh, but you see, when, when the, the kingdom was formed in Israel, well, lots of people thought this is a confederation of tribes. You know, and we put ourselves under... Under, under David, and we did it. We made a decision. We met, all met, we did. We put ourselves under David. It didn't occur to them that they couldn't leave. And they left. And that was the rebellion. It was the war of, of uh, 922, when the North seceded from the Union. We're talking about, we're talking about Israel, of course. Solomon had created a highly controlled and centralized government in a capital city that had only recently been added to Israel's geography. A brand new capital city. There was no reason why anybody in the northern tribes from Manasseh, Ephraim, Naphtali, for example, should feel any loyalty for Jerusalem. It, it, it wasn't even originally part of the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. Now recall that Solomon had divided Israel into political units. We saw this several months ago. That Solomon had divided Israel into political units that were not based on the regional tribal territories. There were lines drawn in. I recall, I didn't actually finish high school. <laughs> But I recall when I was in high school, <laughs> taking a course in civics, and I was quite, I was quite young at, at the time, and I did not see all the implications of it. But I remember the, the authors of this, of this textbook that was used, I think it was used in all the Indiana high schools, which is where I went to school. <laughs> uh, 
It was suggesting that we get rid of the 40, the, at that time, 48 states, <laughs> that we get rid of the 48 states, because that was an anachronism, and divide the country up into, into about 10 regions that could be governed, and we'll all be under the federal government. And the people. Of course, I didn't, I, when, just reading at the time, when I was young, I didn't see that that would lead to another civil war. I didn't, didn't see that at the time, and should. But see, that's essentially what Solomon did. He divided the country without regard to these, these local tribal loyalties. Second reason, the taxes were too high. Now, that's not a problem we have now. <laughs> but let me explain to you what high taxes means. <laughs> Remember back when they originally had the idea of setting up a monarchy, that was Solomon's, pardon not Solomon, Samuel's, that was Samuel's major concern. You get a king, he's going to tax the daylights out of you. And you're going to have to give up all kinds of things that you, you took for granted, such as your freedom, because you're going to have to pay through the nose. Now, for a while that was all right because the economy was booming. Solomon brought about a booming economy. Still, the people were paying, they felt, taxes that were too much. In addition, notice where all the tax revenue is going. To the south. To the tribe of <coughs> Judah. To the tribe of Judah. All the money is going south. What's in the south? What's the major industry of the South? What? The sand? <laughs> Government. Government. <laughs> Judah is contributing very little to the economy of the nation. Because, as Chris mentioned, there's just sand down there. So all the tax money is all going south. Okay. And what is the North getting in exchange for all the money that's going to South? New tax collectors, new IRS agents. 87,000 of them, I'm told. Okay, you see what we got getting it? The tax money was mainly used for the benefit of Southern bureaucrats. Yes, sir. Um, although uh, there was one payoff. Um, uh, in terms of uh, national security, I mean, uh, nobody's messing with Solomon at this time, are they, militarily? <clears throat> Good point. <clears throat> no one's messing with Solomon at this time from a military perspective. That is about to change. Big time. Because what made this whole enterprise of Solomon's possible was a geopolitical vacuum in the Levant at this period. When Egypt is down with the 21st dynasty, the Hittites are down, and the Assyrians haven't arisen yet. See, Saul and David were able to exploit this. Solomon didn't really have to fight any wars. Not really. All you have to do is maintain the borders. That's about to change. Thanks, Chris. Indeed, the universal taxation of the other tribes was the chief source of revenue for the tribe of Judah. The only industry in the South is politics, government. Now let's look once for me. Let us look once again. Return with me now to those yester years. Let us look once again at part of that text from a previous class. First Kings, chapter twelve, begin at verse sixteen. Now when all Israel saw the king Rehoboam did not listen to them. The people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inher inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. That's just an expression, by the way. They weren't living in tents. That's just an expression. 
So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass that whole Israel, all Israel, heard that Jeroboam had come back. They sent for him and called him to the congregation, the Kahal, and made him king over all Israel. Now they recalled him. Where had he been? Egypt. Egypt. You know? Egypt. It tells you something has changed down in Egypt. Because in the meantime, the 21st dynasty has fallen. You're now into the 22nd dynasty, and the founder of the 22nd dynasty was? Shishak. Shishak. Very good. Okay. All Orthodox Christians should know that. What shall be said of Shishak? Yeah. Yes, what shall be said of Shishak? Quid non bicendum de Shishak. Yes, sir. Famous question I got in an exam. The text says there was none who followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. That's a bit of an exaggeration, too, because Judah took Benjamin with them. So, yes, Chris. Um, so Egypt rises pretty quickly. Uh, this is obvious. Shishak was obviously not um, Solomon's father in law, um, whom he was able correct, to. Correct, correct. It's a, it's a new dynasty. Okay. The new dynasty. <coughs> I thought some time back, so a couple of months ago, I would give you guys a history of how the, how the 22nd Dynasty came into power. I thought, if I get onto that, I probably will never get to the Bible again. Because that would remind me of what was happening in Libya at the time. And I would... So that's why I, that's why I avoided that. Okay. It's taken me... It looks to me... I mean, it probably looks to you like I'm, I'm traveling all over the world and these things. But I'm really trying to use some discipline and hone in on the subject itself. You'll have to take my word. I'm really trying. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The other thing that, of course, Judah would have been known for is the temple and the worship. Yeah. We're coming to that. Was well, that supported? Hang, by taxation, yes. By taxation? But we, we'll, 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 we'll hang on to that, just that thought for just a minute. <laughs> See, Eva, Eva knows this stuff, and she's she's pushing ahead, and that, that, and that is that is correct. The temple is temple is going to be very much in play here, because that was a tremendous expense that the whole nation. It was just David's idea. We're going to build a temple here. Okay, David didn't get to build it because the Lord had second thoughts about David, but Solomon built it. Um, we, we will come to the temple presently. Let's look at that map. I thank Nancy again for being. I I just don't know how to get these maps off the off the. Uh, I I printed I printed the maps that you have in front of you. I printed right off the the the, uh, the web page for the map. Nancy Nancy turned it into a file, and I appreciate that very much. Can you find Jerusalem on the map? Okay. See that line running running east-west, just north of Jerusalem? That's the line that separates the tribe of Judah, including Benjamin, from, from Israel. Notice that the kingdom of Israel straddles both sides of the Jordan River. The northernmost city there is Dan, way up in the north. From that time, it recorded in the book of Judges how the Danites migrated north because of pressure coming from the Philistines. Notice that the, 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 the boundary of Israel extends east, well east of the Jordan River, blocked by Syria and Ammon, and to the south from, by Moab. Now that whole region had been part of the United Kingdom under Solomon. The city of Samaria, you see Samaria there up in the northern part, it's a, a little little circle with a star in it. Yeah. For most of Israel's history, that is the capital. For a few years, you just move a little bit east, you see the little, the little city of Tirzah. Tirzah was briefly, from time to time, also capital <coughs> of, of the north. Okay. Father Pat. Yes, ma'am. I see the southernmost city is Kesh Barnea. Yes. But 
I know, I don't know where, but but I but I know many times we hear the expression in the New <coughs> Testament from Dan to Beersheba. That's it. Is that because because the territory that is part of Judah recedes, or is it is there some other reason? One is really pushing it wants to say that Kadesh Barnea is part of it. <coughs> effectively, effectively, Beersheba is. Okay. Effectively. Okay. But that whole region down there between Beersheba and Kadesh Barnea, that's all desert. That's all desert. Uh, when, when, when I was walking around down in that area many years ago, uh, I felt like I was walking on the moon, <coughs> except it was hotter. It was, but it's, it's really quite, it's really quite desert and deserted. See that thing called the Dead Sea? The Dead Sea, that's where the River Jordan empties into the Dead Sea and simply evaporates. I'd like to say I went swimming in the Dead Sea, but you really couldn't call it swimming. You can't really sink enough to use your, your normal swim strokes. I've been in the Dead Sea several times. Uh, but all you do is you sit on the water and float. Uh, there's a picture of me someplace that I'm going to be blackmailed with someday. Of me just sitting there on the water wearing a straw hat. <laughs> you want you more water over here? <laughs> you can almost do that. You can, you can't swim because you you're not further enough down the water to use any strokes. You just you, but you can actually sit on the water. Uh, and I remember my father said that's what I always wanted, a son who was sitting on the water wearing a straw hat. <laughs> Now the northern advantage also has the from the northern king rather also has the advantage of being adjacent to Phoenicia. Notice this? There's Phoenicia, Tyre. See, it says Tyre there. That's Phoenicia. That's that's Phoenicia. Tyre is a is a great mercantile and maritime power. And the northern kingdom is going to benefit from that proximity. The south is not anymore. I'll be right with you. I'm trying to keep all of these uh, papers straight. The northern kingdom has by far the greater part of the arable land and the pastures. It's a bit up the land, the plain of Esdraelon, the plain of Sharon, for example, the great, the great uh, farming communities of Israel. They're all in the north. They're all in the north. Now, what's going to happen when there's a split? Remember that a lot of people during the reign of Solomon, and even before that, but certainly during the reign of Solomon, had given up the land. They had forfeited the inheritance, <coughs> the inheritance of their families. Contrary to the Mosaic law, they found it easier to divest themselves of the land, move to the city, get a really nice job where they only have to work 13 hours a day instead of 17. <laughs> What's going to happen now? Those jobs all disappear. All those mercantile jobs, they disappear. The government jobs, they disappear. The military disappears. You're starting to get growing poverty. The first thing, of the, the first fruit of 922 was immense poverty, unemployment in the South. But also it's going to hit the North. It's going to hit the north in a different way. It's going to hit the north by not just poverty, but wealth. And a big division between the rich and the poor. That's going to be a big characteristic of the northern kingdom. And the first of the literary prophets is going to have a lot to say about that in the 8th century. 
and Andy. Uh, we, it'll be a while before we get to the 8th century, though. It's taken us two years to cover about 70 years, so it'll take us a while to get to the 8th century. And if I go, if I go straying out into Egypt and straying over to Libya, we'll never get there. Um, it was obvious then that the northern kingdom is going to be the wealthier and more, and more prosperous. Now, the year was 922. The northern kingdom, started by the rebellion of Jeroboam, lasted exactly two centuries, to the year 722, when it was destroyed by the Assyrians. Most of the population of the north was deported at that time. Some people were left there. Some people were left there. The Assyrians would move other people in the region who would inter intermarry with those who were left there, creating a new tribe, a new tribal order called the Samaritans. And you know about the Samaritans from the New Testament. Those resettled, those northerners resettled in the east by the Assyrians were absorbed into the national population, the native populations, and essentially lost to history. And that's what we call the Ten Lost Tribes. Now, near the time of Israel's destruction in 722, many of its citizens migrated to the south. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm doing it on purpose. Why do they migrate to the south? Well, so as not to be destroyed or deported. They migrated to the south. This is the reason why we have so much material in the Bible from the northern kingdom. We, we, see, we see it as, as sort of unified. We, we, we get this inheritance. So the Elijah, someone like Elijah, just take a ninth century prophet for now. To, we see Elijah as part of the picture. Elijah was never part of the Davidic operation, ever. Elijah never worshipped in the temple in the south. Just take that example. Elijah, Elijah was, was, was a northerner. Amos preached in the north, but he was a southerner. The only one, clearly, who is a northern prophet among the literary prophets is Hosea. He's the only one. I mean, the reason we have so much material in the Bible from the northern kingdom is that so many of the northerners came south where the traditions were inherited. Yes, Joseph? In other words, this is the case of history being written by the losers, in effect? I don't think so. Okay. I, I mean, I can see why one would, I can see why one would say that. But there's too much that unifies unifies those books around the Davidic covenant, though, for just to say that entirely. But you, but you've got a, you, you're, you're making a good point. That's why there's in the in the books of Kings enormous enormous interest in feel for the north which you do not get in Chronicles. Chronicles, he just writes the north off. He has a treat, he has treatment of, uh, of ap after, after the death of Saul, he just writes the north off in Chronicles. Quite different from the, the, the author of Kings. Indeed, were it not for the records preserved in the kingdom of Judah, we would know nothing about the 200 years in the north, including the stories of the ninth century prophets. We will come to one of those, not right now, maybe a month from now, we will say some things about Elijah and the, the, the place of Elijah in the social consciousness and the, and, 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 and the economic perspectives of, um, of the Bible. In total, the Northern Kingdom had 19 kings, divided by nine dynasties. During most of that time, the capital was Samaria. Hence, the prophets often refer to the northern kingdom simply as Samaria.
As for the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, it lasted from seven, pardon me, from 922 to 587, where it was destroyed by the Babylonians. It was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the bulk of the people, except for some of the farmers, the bulk of the people were carried into captivity. They did not disappear. Something had happened between 722 and 587. Something had happened. The southern kingdom saw what had happened to the north. And they were determined that's not going to happen to us. They developed a whole new style of religion, which made the Israelite religion movable. It became less tied less tied to the temple, not emotionally, but it made, Israel, it made Judah capable of surviving without the temple, which is what they had to do. From that point on, from 587, far more Jews, as we now call them, live outside the Holy Land than within the Holy Land. In fact, there's never been a larger population of the, of the Holy Land by, Jew, by Jews than there is right now. Now, on the handouts, I have listed the kings of Judah and Israel for the remainder of the 10th century. I don't plan to take every one of the kings of Israel and Judah. don't plan to do that. That's because I've got, I've got, I want to concentrate on the economy. Yes, Chris. Speaking of the economy, but then the Southern Kingdom, uh, with uh, with the loss that uh, Rehoboam um, causes, they also lose uh, the Gulf of Aqaba access. Hang on a second. Okay. Uh, no, you have to hang on a little longer. I, I want to say some things about the Gulf of Aqaba, because the, because the Edomites do rebel. Okay. Again, you're like Eva. You keep pushing forward. You get to. <laughs> I love I love students to do that. I have to say that. Now you see the I put those the, those two short lists there. Judah, Jerusalem. The king Rehoboam from 922 to 915, his son Abijah 915 to 913, and Asa 913 to 873, a really long reign. Over in Samaria, in Israel, Jeroboam lasted, Jeroboam the first, we have to call him now, lasted a lot longer from 922 all the way to the, near the end. Then his son Nabat, Nadab, the Bible describes three years to the reign of Nabab, but it seems to me it only, it only spans two years. The, I'll, I'll say more about that in due course. When you start counting how many how many years a king reigns, from where do you start the year? You start counting the year. And if he reigns two or three months into the next year, and remember, the dates for the beginning of a new year are also switched through history. When does the new year begin? It doesn't always begin at Rosh Hashanah, not in certain periods. There are certain periods of Israel's history when it begins at Pascha. So you, you've got shifting dates with all... Now, the northern kingdom immediately turned apostate. Now, come, that brings you back to Eva's come in. 1 Kings chapter 12, beginning at verse 25. You got that text, I think? <clears throat> then Jeroboam fortified <coughs> Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and, <coughs> and dwelt there. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. <coughs> If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now, he doesn't want to mess with the people's religion. <clears throat> At least not too much. He knows that there's people have been worshiping 
in the temple ever since it was built, and they're proud of the temple, and they're glad to go to the temple and so forth. But he says, they go on down to the temple, for long, they're going to be going to Jerusalem for other reasons as well. And, they're going to, and he knows how shaky his, his kingdom is. <clears throat> Therefore, the king sought counsel, made two calves of gold, <clears throat> and said to the people, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, or here is your God, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, in extreme south, and the other he put in Dan, in extreme north. So you could have, so you have two shrines, one in the south, one in the north. Each place is going to have a golden calf. The two shrines in the extreme north and south means that real Boham repeats the sin of Israel in the desert. In fact, it's going to be twice as bad because he's got two golden calves. The Exodus text says, Hine Eloeka Israel. Hine means behold. Okay. Eloeka Israel. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God, but it is, is, it is itself plural. Okay. It's in the construct here Eloeka Israel. Behold, Israel, here is your God. Asher okay. Haaluk Me'eretz Misraim who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so what does is, what is Jeroboam say to the people? Hele Eloecha. These are your gods, Israel. Asher ha'haluch ma'aretz, pardon me, ma'aretz, rather, there's no, no article there. Ma'aretz Misraim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So the northern kingdom now separates itself from the worship of the true God, even though they don't think of themselves as doing that. Was there any resistance to that? Probably. Probably. At the t time, I, I, think, I can only say probably at the time. By the ninth century, you better believe it. When you, when you, <coughs> imagine how Elijah would react to that. If all. But the one, <coughs> The ones who resist, though, Katie, would be would be the prophets. Okay. Okay. So there wasn't a, well, we don't really. I, I take it back. We don't really have to. We really don't have to uh, to guess at that because there are prophets already who speak to Rehoboam on this subject. I haven't read those texts to you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, there's resistance. Yeah. Over the course of First and Second Kings. The material about the kings themselves constantly referred to two earlier sources identifies as the Chronicles of Israel and Judah. Okay. The Chronicles of Israel and Judah. These are not the books of Chronicles. Okay. Everybody hear me? These references are not to the books of Chronicles. This is an earlier record. Our biblical books of Chronicles are much later, and there's really only one chronicler. Whereas these earlier records are the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah and the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, two different works. These are much earlier works that are no longer extant. What are these works? They seem to have been official records preserved in the capitals of each kingdom. The name translated as Chronicle, I put down, in, I put down the Hebrew text, is literally the books of the words of the days for the kings. Sefer, Sefer Dibre, the wor book of the, wor of the words, okay. Hayamim, the of the, of the of the days of the king. Same expression, it simply ends, ends up with Yehuda or Israel, the kings of Israel, king of Judah, king of Israel. Over the rest of the, of the books of kings, 
The author goes back and forth between the two kingdoms, trying to preserve a straight chronology. He sets the beginning of each reign according to its chronological relationship to the other kingdom. You get this as you all go through, through the Book of Kings. I, I don't know that I will ever publish my, my commentary on Kings. I don't know if I ever will. Um, it'll, it'll depend on, it'll depend if I can post on my physical strength, but there needs to be, there really need, the Orthodox people really need to have a simple historical introduction to this, to this, to this, this, this work of literature. Because he was already telling the story of Jeroboam's re rebellion, the author continues his nar narrative in the north. First Kings 14, beginning of verse 19. Do you have that? Or is that just me? I had to leave out some of your notes here because I wanted to get it all on one page. Yes, sir. We know it's here. It's here. Okay. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, Indeed, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings, Chronicle of the Kings of Israel. Sefer Dibrei, Hayamin, Malke Israel. The time that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years. So he slept with his father, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. Then the author, having placed Nadab on the throne of in the north, in the year 901, goes back south to speak of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. His further description of the reign of Rehoboam requires only seven more verses. And Rehoboam dies in 915. Do you have 1 Kings 14, 29? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did are written in the, in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings, okay. Sefer, Divrei, Hayamim, Mamalki, Yahuda, Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So Rehoboam slept with his fathers, was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus, then Abijah, his, <coughs> then Abijah, his son, reigned in his place. Okay. Are there any questions so far? All right. Did I, did I give you 1 Kings 15, 1? Yes. yes. Okay, it is there then. But we're going to stick with the south for a while. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijah became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Now, I've underlined that in my copy. I don't think it's underlined in yours. Okay. But I want you to note that. His mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Okay. Now, why, whenever he relates the kings of Judah, why does the author tell who his mother was? Habitually names the mother. Okay. The mother of the king is of extreme importance in the Bible. No one but the king is more important. See, these kings had many wives. When they say queen in the Bible, they do not mean the one married to the king. They mean the mother of the king. You remember the story? I've, I've told you the story many times. In fact, sometimes when, when people who are not raised in the church hear this story, it, it suddenly jerks them right into reality. Okay. How come you give such honor to the mother of Jesus? You, go, you prostrate before her. Okay. You kiss her picture. You make sure she's on your side. Why do you do that? Okay. Okay. Go to the beginning, first chapter of First Kings. Bathsheba, the wife of David, 
comes into the throne room. She prostrates herself before her husband. As I told Denise, a guy could get some respect back in those days. Have you ever gotten on the good side of a Jewish man by insulting his mother? <coughs> or by neglecting her. Or by neglecting her, yes. Okay, that's what... The next time Bathsheba enters the throne room, David's gone. Solomon's on the throne. Read it for yourself. What happens? Solomon gets up from the throne, prostrates himself before his mother. Okay. We honor the Virgin Mary too much, all right? Please, give me a break. That's the Gavira. Yes, Father. Why, do, why is that only mentioned for the kings of Judah? The kings of Israel, the, the mother, the queen mother is never mentioned. But the, the kings of Judah... I mean, it's easy for us to see that as a prophecy because... But notice at the beginning, she is named okay. for, for, for Jeroboam. But you don't, you, you simply do not have the dynastic, dynastic continuity. You've got, you've got, you've got nine dynasties. The, the, the mother of the king is, is... Now, I won't say that the, the mother of the kings of the north are not powerful. They are <laughs> extremely powerful. I'm thinking of someone like Jezebel. You know, I mean, if you get Desi Arnaz to sing songs about you, you are powerful. <laughs> oh, a little humor there, I thought it lightened the spirit. This is, this is still true in places. Yes, yes Arlene it is. and I were on a tour in, in, in a, a, on, a, on a bus in, in uh, Bangkok, and the, the, the guy talked about, you know, the queen doing this and that. Of course, I knew it meant the queen mother. Yes. But I said, I better, <laughs> but, you know, the rest of the Americans on board probably didn't have a clue, so I tried to bring it up <laughs> and have her clarify. It, it is. It's Especially those, since the king, a um, bit of a ne'er-do-well in my opinion. We won't, we won't go with two, it. We, two wives. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you know, plenty of kings have had so, more, more than one wife, that's for sure. Right. But normally, except in very rare circumstances, they only have one mother. <laughs> but notice here, please notice that Maica is described as the mother of Abijah. Please notice that. Continue reading. The rest of the acts of Abijah and all that he did, they are written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Judah. Same expression. The book of the days of the kings, uh, the book of the days of the years. Pardon me, the books of the words of the years. So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah, and he reigned forty-one years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Does anybody see a problem? Yeah. He's described his his grandmother is described as his mother. Mm -hmm. the, there's a lot I want to say about that, but I'm leave that for the next class. So you'll come back two weeks from now and find out how this father's how this fellow's mother is his grandmother. <laughs> okay. Do you want to uh, mention anything about Shishak's role? No, I don't want to mention anything about it. The, that would be a distraction. The impoverishment of the southern kingdom? No, I don't want to say anything about that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm seeing children come in. So, and that, this is, I've got this as the next section. It got that in bold letters, which means I was probably planning to stop at this place anyway. Okay. See, you all, see you all in two weeks. Next week, come back. And listen, Joseph the Tender leads you in high spiritual matters and the worship of God and so forth. Glory to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Now and ever, the God who is, who was, and is to come at the end of time. Amen. Thank you, Father.